Hey everybody, welcome to another video. In this video, I want to talk about how to interpolate environment variables in Swagger definition files. So recently, we had to use Swagger on the project I'm working on to generate some, well, first to create an API definition file, and then uh, further down the road, the, the teams who would consume that API to use that definition file to generate client libraries for their programming language of choice. The problem is that you are unable to integrate, to interpolate environment variables in Swagger YAML definition files. And I want to show you how I managed to get around that. So I have the script already here. Uh, I won't walk you through uh, actually writing the script because I already created this, but I want to walk you through what I used and how I thought about everything, how I laid everything out so that I could use the Swagger CodeGen uh, application command line utility actually to generate uh, client libraries for my uh, API and also interpolate environment variables. So why would I need environment variables in the first place? If you take a look at this Swagger definition file is just a plain old definition file. I'll actually put it up on GitHub and uh, link it in, in the video. But I would probably need environment variables, for example, for the host, right? Because otherwise I would be generating client libraries that would have localhost 8000 hard-coded uh, inside. And let's say for the base path. So let me just open the terminal of Visual Studio Code. And let's just run Swagger Code Gen. So this is basically the command you have to run with the Swagger YAML definition file. You'll have to pass it the input file, then the language uh, of the target, uh, the target language of the client library, and then the output directory. So you, if I just hit return over here, it just parses the YAML and then does a lot of things and puts everything into TMP over here. So it's TMP test. And then we have um, our documentation, the source of our library, and then some tests, I think, and a couple of, uh, of more files. I won't go into much detail uh, with this. But if we look at the, I think it's API client, if I'm not mistaken, see this base path equals, well, I should probably just drop the HTTP here. I'm sorry, but it's localhost 8000 slash V1, which is exactly what I said here, right? Let me just delete this and run it one more time just to make sure that we get the same output. So this gets recreated and now it's HTTP colon slash slash localhost 8000 slash V1. So the thing is that if I wanna deploy this on what, let's say a QA environment, a user acceptance testing environment, um, I would have to either have separate definition files for each environment or manually go in and change the host and path um, for each uh, new deployment or have some sort of script replace it for me, which is exactly what, what I did. So I created this small script. I'll walk you through the modules and what each of them do. So I use .m, which is pretty standard. It basically takes uh, an environment definitions file that looks kind of like this one. And it puts everything on process.emv and makes it available for the, the following code and for the script or for the application if it's an Express.js uh, server. Then I use the standard file system module path, which is also bundled like with Node.js. Then I use CLI. So at first 
I went on and parsed the arguments to this script because this is also a command line script. This is what I'm why I am actually uh, specifying this uh, as the first line of my file, which is hashbang usr bin env node. That's so I can run it just like I would run any command line utility uh, on the, the on Linux. And so I was using process.argv, which is basically the uh, arguments vector um, that this file receives whenever it's executed in the command line from the command line using dot and then slash and create flagger blah blah blah. So I thought that there there must be a better way since there are so many command line utilities on the web and so sure enough I found this module on the web rather quickly has some decent amount of downloads has a decent enough API like really really simple because I did not need a lot uh, from it so okay this is just a, a constant for me so I don't keep repeating myself then I parse the options so this is basically parsing process.argv and I assign whatever the script receives from the command line to this object with this structure file lang and output and what's nice is that this also gives you the output for the dash dash help as we'll see, so uh, let's create flagger client dash dash help and see this is the help file it's exactly and it also does short form and long form uh, arguments for you so it's it's really really nice. Then it has this thing which is the spinner it's, it's just a, a, a a UI so it basically shows working and then the sl the slashes and the pipes you you'll see it it's just something to to tell you that this thing is doing something while you're looking at it and so let's get down to the actual nitty-gritty of the thing so what I'm doing here is I am parsing um, whatever is in options.file so in my case it'll be swagger yaml and i'm parsing it to a javascript object so i'm first reading it from the file system of course then i am parsing it as a javascript object and putting it in this variable swagger config i use this module called substitute which is actually shell substitute which i also found on the web rather quickly so this is js yaml this is the module i'm using for uh, parsing uh, YAML to JavaScript and then JavaScript back to YAML but we were talking about shell substitute so it's basically shell substitution in JavaScript so instead of me doing uh, string replacement manually I just looked up this module it has 20,000 uh, plus weekly downloads so uh, I'm I don't think that it does a lot, so it, it won't kill me. I, I It's not something that requires performance tuning or anything like that. It's just a simple script. So I just went with the first thing that looked like it could provide what I was looking for. So basically what shell substitute does uh, is it takes the string, the stringified. So I'm, I'm serializing swagger config here. I'm, I'm converting it to a string. I'm taking the JavaScript object, convert, converting it to a string. And then I pass it process.env, which is previously populated with my environment variables uh, by .env. And substitute will take whatever it finds in process.env and replace it in the in the the serialized version of swagger config so up until now i'm loading the yaml as a javascript object then i am replacing uh the environment variables uh the placeholders actually with the environment variables of my choosing and then i am converting everything back to yaml so this safe dump function takes a javascript object so i am converting my uh, resulting string with the environment variables and everything in place i'm converting it back to a javascript object and i'm passing it to safe dump so it can convert it back to a proper yaml 
and I am ultimately writing the file contents to the disk in this file, Swagger with bars YAML. And now to get to the actual command execution, so we'll go over these uh, functions in a, in a moment. I am using cli.exec, which behind the scenes uses childprocess.exec, as we can already see over here. So it's a wrapper for childprocess.exec. And I am passing it a string, uh, a template, a template string, a template, yeah, template string. And th this template string is my actual Swagger code gen command, where I'm saying, yeah, generated with this Im input file. Sorry, like the input file is output file with mvars. I'm sorry. So basically, it's generating using my uh, compiled YAML definition file with environment variables. And then it keeps the language. So options.lang uh, is the argument that my script receives. So it passes that down to Swagger code gen and then the output path. And then it takes two callbacks, success and error. Now, pretty straightforward. So success basically closes uh, uh, the, the, the spinner. So it, it tells it to stop spinning, so to speak. So basically by passing true as a second argument, uh, uh, tells the, the, the spinner to, to stop. And then it just prints a message with uh, a, a pretty nice colorful message uh, indicating where the, the output has been placed. Now for error, this is really interesting because Swagger code gen prints everything. So these messages you saw over here, I'm just make, going to make everything a little bigger. So this is standard error. It's not standard output, although it's just info. So right now what I'm doing is I'm verifying whether or not my error, the error that I'm getting here is an instance of error because in this situation, what I'm getting is a string. It's not an actual error. So if it's an error, then I'm telling the user that, hey, this kind of crashed and then CLI.fatal basically exits the process. Otherwise, I'm calling success behind the scenes. If I switch over to Chrome and we look at the source code because I had to, I had to see this. So my colleagues were like, when I left them with this script, they said like, hey, yo, it prints an error, but it's working. So I guess we're cool. And I'm like, no, it's not cool. Let's see why it's working, but it says that it's not working. So sure enough, cli.exec, this function over here, after executing child process uh, dot exec and delegating to it, on the callback, if you see here, it reassigns error. So it says my error argument is either whatever I'm getting over here, if this is an actual error, otherwise it's the standard error. So if anything is printing to the standard error, even if it's a poorly written debug message that should be on standard output, actually on std out instead of std error, then it assigns it error. And then here, of course, error is not uh, an, em an empty string, right? In our case, standard error. It's an actual string with those messages. And so then it looks for the error callback and it calls it with what it believes to be the error. This is the reason I'm calling the success callback or the success function in my error function because Java. Let's just test the script and let's see if it works. So I will first delete this. Then in the YAML file, let's look. I already have this file here, swaggervars.env, where I have my host name and my base path. And so I will go and replace everything here. So I will say dollar sign host. You can host name. So I will say dollar sign host name. And then I'll also do dollar sign base path. Save this. And then let's see. So we have this. I should remove the HTTPS over here. 
and this is API. And so let me execute this now. So it's create swagger client dash dash file. And I already have fish doing the auto complete here because I ran this before. So now if I hit return, we should see a JS dash client directory uh, appear over here and it does. And now if we look, we have to look, where do we look first? Let's look in the, in the documentation. So first write all your eyes are relative to HTTP colon slash slash whatever. And then if we look in the source in the API uh, client, sure enough, I have base path set to my new, you know, my, to my new domain. So I'm planning on publishing this to NPM. It has a couple of caveats. I'll have to ask the developer to either pass in the M file or I will have them have a pre-configured, hard-coded, static environment variable file. I don't know. Either way, I think I'm going to post this on NPM. I'll publish it on GitHub either way. And so hopefully this was useful. I It really helped me understand how to do variable interpolation, especially since my my first thought when, when thinking about pushing uh, environment variables in YAML was Docker Compose, which actually supports uh, environment variables in the YAML configuration file. And so it really helped me, let's say, better understand the, the dynamics of that. And I also found some, some interesting, interesting libraries that I can add to my existing tool chain. Catch you in the next one. Thanks for watching and goodbye.